I invite you to turn your Bibles this morning to Leviticus chapter 25. And this is the next to the last in our series of sermons on the book of Leviticus. Next Sunday we'll wrap it up and bring it to a close. I'm trusting we can do that. Uh, there's actually uh, 27 chapters in Leviticus. And so we'll, we'll go through the, next, the last two fairly quickly and make some applications then to our life. We've had some very, very uh, good conversations, actually, about, uh, about the book of Leviticus. And, and, and in the times that I've spent in small groups, actually had some very important uh, decisions made and some uh, challenges put out as to things that we think that God's been speaking to us about as far as changes in our life and changes in our conduct and different perspectives that we might have on how we ought to live this life. And uh, this morning, I'd like for us to read from Leviticus chapter 25, the first uh, 22 verses of the chapter. It's, pretty in it's interesting that uh, this is here. We had several weeks ago talked about the Sabbath and had quite a conversation about the Sabbath, as we should, and then um, we skipped skipped a week or skipped a chapter, and then came over to now chapter twenty-five. But the, uh, this chapter is having to do not so much with the calendar, and not so much with our personal lives, but with the land. How do we treat the land? Which is a particularly important topic for us today. Typically, the very conservative fundamentalist Christians. Uh, don't take a really strong stand on the environment. In fact, is um, from where I come from, we used to make a mockery of the tree huggers. And I don't know if they still do. I've been gone kind of a long time from, from the mother. Well, I can't really say that's my mother country, but from my country of passport, okay? <laughs> so uh, I get to go back now and, and, and check it out. But I, I, um, when I did my master's degree in the States there, I... I was really confronted with a whole different perspective on this idea of uh, what, God, what God might think of how we're treating the environment he's given to us. And uh, it caused me to really think twice again about some of the comments that I made about what we're... <clears throat> you know, I mean, there's, there's people take things too far either way you go. So uh, I just think that we need to have a very healthy attitude toward what God has given to us here. Now, the Sabbath year... Let's begin reading with Leviticus 25, beginning with verse 1. The Lord spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land that I give you, the land shall keep a Sabbath to the Lord. For six years you shall sow your field, and for six years you shall prune your vineyard and gather in its fruits. But in the seventh year there shall be a Sabbath of solemn rest for the land. A Sabbath to the Lord, you shall not sow your field or prune your vineyard. You shall not reap what grows of itself in your harvest or gather the grapes of your undressed vine. It shall be a year of solemn rest for the land. The Sabbath of the land shall provide food for you, for yourself and for your male and female slaves and for your hired servant and the sojourner who lives with you and your cattle and for the wild animals that are in your land all its yield shall be for food. Verse 80 begins uh, the year of Jubilee. You shall count seven weeks of years, seven times seven years, so that the time of the seven weeks of years shall give you 49 years. Then you shall sound the loud trumpet on the tenth day of the seventh month. On the day of atonement, you shall sound the trumpet throughout all your land. And you shall consecrate the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you. When each of you shall return to his property and each of you shall return to his clan. That 50th year shall be a jubilee for you. In it you shall neither sow nor reap what grows of itself nor gather the grapes from the undressed vines for it is a jubilee. It shall be holy to you. You may eat the produce of the field. In this year of Jubilee, 
Each of you shall return to his property. And if you make a sale to your neighbor or buy from your neighbor, you shall not wrong one another. You shall pay your neighbor according to the number of years after the jubilee, and he shall sell to you according to the number of years for crops. If the years are many, you shall increase the price, and if the years are few, you shall reduce the price, for it is the number of the crops that he is selling to you. You shall not wrong one another, but you shall fear your God, for I am the Lord your God. Therefore, you shall do my statutes and keep my rules and perform them, and then you will dwell in the land securely. The land will yield its fruit. You will eat your fill and dwell in it securely. And if you say, what shall we eat in the seventh year, if we may not sow or gather in our crop? And I will command my blessing on you in the sixth year, so that it will produce a crop sufficient for three years. When you sow in the eighth year, you will be eating some of the old crop. You shall eat the old until the ninth year when its crop arrives. The chapter is a rather long one. Uh, we won't read the remainder of the chapter. I just want to speak to you this morning about the Jubilee. The Jubilee. Um, Anybody know what jubilee means? It's kind of like, actually the word that it comes from in the Hebrew is trumpet. Because at the blowing of the trumpet in the tenth day of the seventh month then, there, that's the beginning of this year, uh, the Sabbath year, and particularly of the year of jubilee. So after seven sevens of the Sabbath year, uh, Sabbath years, then you have the year of Jubilee that comes with the blowing of the trumpet. And so um, the subtitle for today's sermon is Yippee, I'm free in the year of Jubilee. Uh, <clears throat> that needs to go to a song of some sort, but not something that I'm going to do, I'll promise you that. So <clears throat> in our conversations with regarding the Sabbath rest, one of the small groups took a challenge to intentionally establish a day of Sabbath so that we report back to each other about how we spent our Sabbath day for the week. Because I, I'm reminded that in the Ten Commandments, um, if they're valid, how many of you would say that the Ten Commandments are valid commandments we should obey? How many of you just say, well, yeah, I'm not really sure, Pastor. I mean, honestly, I'm not really sure. Uh, the reason I say that is because most people, whether you're Christians or not, I, I should say most Westerners, most Westerners, Christian or not, would give some kind of uh, importance to the Ten Commandments. But little do most people know that the Fourth Commandment is, Thou shalt keep the Sabbath day holy. And my experience is that very few Christians keep the Fourth Commandment, really. Uh, and, and maybe we keep the fourth commandment in the way we think that it should be kept, but for very few actually keep the fourth commandment in the way that the scriptures teach that it should. And so, um, if we're wondering whether or not we're sinners, and if a sinner is one who breaks one of the Ten Commandments, and very few of us keep the fourth commandment, then what does that say about us? It says, we all need a Savior, <laughs> We desperately need a Savior, and we need, and the Bible tells us that there's blessings from being obedient to, the, uh, to uh, our Lord. So my, my feeling is this. In our fast-paced life, in our fast-paced living, there's two things that seems to be deeply lacking, and that is, number one, I would say, is peace. Very few people have a deep inner peace. Would you agree with me on that? Doesn't it seem that, there, that so many people... Uh, want this, but there just seems to be some sense of turmoil, whether it's outright and, and, and on the surface or whether it's, but it seems like there's very few people who could say they have a deep sense of inner peace regardless of what's happening on the outside. The other thing that I think that we're, that we're deeply missing is rest. And I just, I just see tired people all the time. And I'm amazed at how many people really, um, uh, I understand why moms are tired. Honestly, I really do understand why moms are tired. Uh, after having six children, I totally understand why moms are tired. I don't get it why dads are tired, but, but moms, 
Uh, I, I, I totally understand. But uh, the other thing is, we, we live in a society in which we think the boss is ruler. You know, we let bosses run our lives. Now, if you're a boss, please, please don't get me wrong. But, but, but honestly, uh, I, I'm really amazed in how people just absolutely cannot take control of their life and, and say no. It's unheard of to say no to the boss. And I'm thinking, you know what? No wonder bosses abuse because we can't say no. And, and there's more to life. I, I'm, I'm simply saying to you that, that we need to be careful that we take ownership for our lives and not give it up to somebody else to run for us, including pastors of churches who try and get people to work all the time, you know. And so uh, it's time to take, to take responsibility for our lives. If you're lacking in peace and rest, let me tell you something, nobody else can help you but yourself. I don't mean to say that you have to depend upon yourself, but you're the one who has to make the decision. If you need peace in your heart, you can go and ask God. I can't ask God for you. If you need rest in your life, it's something you have to take responsibility for. And so uh, I, I, I firmly believe, and more so having studied this book of Le Leviticus and, and gone again and reviewed through the Old Testament, I'm, I am firmly convinced we need a Sabbath rest in our life. Deeply need a Sabbath rest. Something that becomes a part of our rhythm. Now, in this passage of uh, chapter 25, God is telling his people then, after already having told them how to have rest in their life, how to give the land rest. Now, these people that we're talking about in Leviticus are not in their land yet. They're on the journey to the promised land. They don't know yet that it's going to be another 40 years or a generation that before they get into the land, but they have within them this anticipation. We get to go, we're, we're soon going to be in our land. We can put our roots down. We can get to work. You know, there's a certain satisfaction out there. I, I have to say, I, I, not never, but rarely do I feel bad about coming back from a vacation because I really do like the rhythm that daily routine has. I mean, I, I, I get up, for example, now I'm getting ready to go on a trip back to the States. The other day I got up in the morning like I normally do and go grind some coffee and pour a nice cup of coffee. And I'm thinking, how are you going to do this when you're traveling, man? I mean, you, you don't have a grinder you can carry with you, and you just don't pop into the kitchen and get your hot water and have your coffee and sit down and, and, and reflect. And, and then when it comes time for making breakfast, you know, I'm very careful what I have for breakfast. And when, you, when you're on the road, all that gets messed up, you know. I mean, even having the place where you go to get your teeth brushed, it's all a part of a routine, and, and I don't like that. I mean I, I mean, I like the routine. I don't like having it messed up. So I'm already in my mind, I'm imagining how it's going to be along the way, how I'm going to try and develop routine over the next. What I'm saying is this, you have these people who had 400 years been in Egypt. Now they've been uh, delivered from Egypt for where they're glad, but they're on this journey. They're living in tents. Everything's uh, in flux, and they don't have a land that they put down their roots, but they're looking toward that land. And now God is telling them, when you get to that land, here's what you can expect. In their anticipation, he's telling them this, that, there's going to be a time when you're going to start producing. They want to be producing. And God tells them that like humans have to have a rest from producing, so does the land need a rest from producing. We don't get that in our corporate world today. In our corporate world today, there's no sabbatical year. Now, sometimes we get it in the, in the educational field because professors, after a certain amount of time, are supposed to get a sabbatical year in which they get... In fact, I've heard that churches give pastors a sabbatical year so the pastor can go and, and really just read and refresh and learn and, make, and so forth. Uh, great idea. I think it's a good idea for not just the, uh, academics and pastors. I think it's a good idea for, for all corporations. Wish I could say it was my idea, but it wasn't. <clears throat> so God tells them. He teaches them. Rest and productivity go together. Did you get that? Rest and productivity go together. Some companies have learned that. Tired employees are not good producers. And so they've, they've, they've worked hard to make sure they present an environment in which 
they can have rested employees because rested employees, and it's true for families, tired children don't produce. Tired people don't produce. Productivity and rest go together. We, we can see that very clearly being taught to us here. Now, so there's some things that he wants them to understand. To get the most out of the land for the Israelites, there are certain principles that are taught in this passage that are very important to learn. And I, frankly, I'd say sometimes, I, I, well, you can judge for yourself, but I think some of them are a little bit difficult. One of the principles that is clearly made here is that I'm taking you, God says, to this promised land. It's not your land. It's my land. I'm taking you to my land, which I'm giving you, but I'm not giving you in ownership. I'm giving you to bless you and to take care of you. But remember, fundamentally, at its core, this is my land. In our, in our consumer society, that's a difficult concept. When I was living in Hong Kong, out in the New Territories, uh, back uh, before 1997, we went there in 1983, thereabouts, moved out to the New Territories, and uh, after a few years there, we actually bought a house in the New, New Territories. In, in Hong Kong, when you buy, at that time when you buy a house, you buy the house, you don't get the land. Because the land was on a 99-year lease from China to the British colony. That lease was up in 1997, hence the whole discussion of what are we going to do about the lease? Is it going to be renewed or, and China says, no, 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 renewal, we want it. So anyway, that was the end of that conversation. So uh, it's not uncommon then to just get what's on the land but not to own the land. In, our, uh, in, in America, at least, you can actually own the land, but then there's discussions about mineral rights and et cetera, et cetera. The bottom line is this. God is telling his people in Leviticus 25, verse 23, the land shall not be sold in perpetuity, for the land is mine, God says. You're strangers, you're sojourners with me. And that word strangers is resident alien. Wait, where have I heard that word before? Hear it all the time. The other thing that God wants his people to understand is, and this, this might be a little bit difficult for some of us, and that is, not only does God own the land, God owns the people. God owns the people. Especially in our Western way of thinking, with personal rights and so forth, we, we have a strong sense, and I just got done saying, let's take responsibility for our lives, right? But we have this strong sense that I am my own boss. And to a certain extent, that's true. But God says to his people, you may be your own boss, but I own you. I own you. Why does he say that? Because he tells us in Leviticus chapter 25, verse 55, for it is to me that the people of Israel are servants. They're my servants whom I brought out of the land of Egypt, I am the Lord your God. He's saying, I am the one who delivered you out of that land of Egypt. I'm the one who freed you from being in bondage and ownership to the Egyptian people. Now then, you are my people. It's a very important principle for the Jews to understand, especially then when they go into their own land. There's some things that they need to understand about that, and we'll, we'll look into uh, just that thing. The other thing that God tells his people and that we learn in this passage God owns the land, God owns the people, God gives the increase. God gives the increase. Another very important lesson for us to learn, because we often think that the production is on our part, when God says he gives the increase. He says, and if you say, what shall we eat in the seventh year, if we may not sow or gather in our crop, then he's, God's reply is, I will command my blessing on you on the sixth year that it produce a crop sufficient for three years. So these, these, are very, these three things are very important for the Jews to understand. This is what he's getting across in this passage here. But, but then he comes up with this, uh, he begins to talk about this thing called Jubilee. That's a pretty interesting idea, actually. Pretty interesting concept. I say idea and concept because... Well, that's what it was. Why did God give them, why did God give this jubilee plan? Well, he understands our human nature. And it's our human nature then that 
um, <coughs> we want to get things, and if we don't get things, we'll, we, or if we make mistakes and we get into debt, once we get into debt, he understands it gets worse and worse and worse. And he also understands that when he leaves us as a people to ourselves, what happens is there's a tendency to be a growing gap between those who have wealth and those who don't have wealth. I, I'm a subscriber to The Economist magazine. It's an expensive magazine, but you know, they, give a, they, they have a, a very, I think, a fairly realistic view of uh, what's going on in the world. And, and one of the themes that I keep seeing coming up over and over again is the growing gap between the rich and the poor in developed worlds. This is a major problem happening, taking place right now in China also, which is particularly difficult because it's a communist country, which everybody's supposed to be on the same plane, you know. And uh, the government says, um, what's mine is mine and what yours is mine. And so it's, I'm going to distribute it evenly, but we're finding that's easier said than done. In our own country, in the United States, there's also a growing problem of the, of the gap that's between the rich and the poor. And so the, present, the, the, the president now says, what I'm going to do is I'm going to tax every wealthy person 30% of their income to give to those who don't. So it's, again, redistributing the wealth. Well, God has a plan for that too, by the way. Not Democrat, not Republican, not Marxist or whatever. God has his plan. Uh, evidently, we don't think God's plan works too well because we really haven't ever tried it. Um, and I can understand that it might be a bit difficult for our mind. But the Jubilee concept was to prevent the utter ruin of debtors and to maintain a stable economy and society. When a person in biblical times incurred a debt, that means that he's got to repay it. And again, this is at this time a cashless society. So it's not like you dip into your pocket and pull out your plastic card and go more into debt to pay your debt. No, that's not the way it works. Uh, if you, if you, you have to take actually uh, real property, um, I like the way the Chinese say it, Pudong uh, Chan, right? The real estate that doesn't move, the stuff that doesn't move, yeah. And so um, uh, it's uh, unmovable, and, and therefore, if what you have is, your choice is your land or yourself. Your land or yourself. And so that meant there were times that a person would have to give himself. So if left unchecked, without a, a balance to it, this would cause great social division. The, and, and you'd have great wealthy landowners and then a large group of landless serfs and servants and slaves. So, thus about once in a man's lifetime, the slate was wiped clean. Everyone had the chance to make a fresh start. The rich had to part with the land and slaves that they had acquired in the previous 49 years, and the poor recovered their land and freedom. The jubilee would restore some semblance of equality between men, therefore recapturing something of the relationship that existed between men at their creation. So here's the deal. Uh, at the, uh, on the 50th year, what happens is there's, there's buying and selling of, of, of land that takes place during those 50 years. There's buying and selling of people. Now, let's, don't choke on that yet because... You know, we, we want to look at that. But buying and selling of land, buying and selling of people, or property. But at the 50th year, at the year of Jubilee, everything goes back to where it started from. Every 50 years. And so that means that probably in our lifetime, if this had happened some 50 years ago, I would have been 10 years old. And so I would have meant that this year, and 10 years old, you don't really understand the Jubilee very much. But this year, I would really understand it all my debts would be taken care of. But not only would all my debts be taken care of, the house that I bought in the States would go back to the original owner. And it kind of, uh, it, it kind of gives an equality across the land again, and, and we go into these 50-year cycles or seven cycles of seven. Um, <clears throat> the fact is, Israel didn't do it. <laughs> and uh, they may have done it once or twice. But there's really, in the scriptures, there's little or no record of, of this cycle of uh, jubilee years. And we do know that uh, this seven cycles of the Sabbath land rest, every seven years, the Latin is supposed to, they didn't do that either. Uh, because God specifically told them, when they, were, when they were taken 
off the land and taken into captivity by Babylon, God says, you're going to stay in Babylon until the Sabbath years of the land have been fulfilled. So in other words, those years, 70-some years that they were in captivity, was God saying, I'm going to be sure the land gets the rest I intended for it to have. And so they were off the land, their land, until the end of the captivity. Um, here's what Israel has to say as far as, um, here's what Isaiah, excuse me, here's what Isaiah has to say with regard to Israel's ig ignoring God's plan. He says, woe to those who join house to house who add field to field until there's no more room. You are made to dwell alone in the midst of the land. So in other words, what somebody has done is they've collected houses and lands until they have this huge piece of property, and they're in the middle of it. On the other hand, we see this happen in cities, too. Cities are incredibly crowded, not because we're the only one living there, but because of the fact that houses and things are just jammed together. Amos, who is another prophet, he says this about, the, about Israel. He says, for three transgressions of Israel and for four, I will not revoke the punishment because they sell the righteous for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. Here's, a, a, an, here's an example of exploiting the poor, which God very clearly stated. You cannot treat the poor this way, especially your own people. So, as far as we know, this jubilee was never practiced. It'd be interesting to see what would happen. Uh, the problem is that we don't live on the land like we used to. I mean, like, they, like people used to. So it's not like I'm going to give you back your land because I never took your land. And, and, uh, we, we are, and back then they didn't have banks. You know, It's not like I just take cash and pay for it. You paid for it with, with real stuff. And, and uh, yeah, the money's not so real, in fact. <laughs> it's just a piece of paper. It's just what you think about it, that's all. And so all you have in the bank is just some figures, a piece of paper. What do you get for it? More paper. Is that a good way to look at it, huh? It's not any good unless you buy land with it, you know. I mean, something you can walk on and say, this is mine. So how did the Jubilee work? I told you, every seventh day, the land has to lie fallow for one year. The sabbatical year allowed for the reprieve for the poor. On every seven years, the slaves and servants had to be let loose. The land wasn't let loose, but the slaves were let loose. And then uh, some at that time could decide whether they wanted to leave or to stay. But uh, if they decided to stay, then they would become a part of that, uh, uh, that landowner's family or possessions until the year of Jubilee in which everything was put back as it should be. Then God says about this seventh sabbatical year, this new start, uh, it's intended for everyone to put them back on an even keel. Here, here's why I think it would have been very difficult to do. Because every seven years now, every seventh year is a sabbatical year. The land rests. So we get to the 49th year. The 49th year is a sabbatical year. The land rests. The 50th year is also a sabbatical year. God made it very clear. You're not to touch the land. So we've got two years in a row. So think about this. Number one, you, you, you need to be planning ahead to be a part of God's plan, right? You don't want to go to, oh, no, I hear the trumpet starts a sabbatical year, and I made no plans for it, and I'm not ready at all. So there needs to be some forethought. Then when you get to the, to the jubilee year, when you've got two years together like this, you particularly need to be, to be thinking ahead. And, and God, in, in his in his providence, understands that there needs to be this cycle to put things back into, into uh, uh, an, an equity again. But I think that the problem is people choked on the two years. I would. Come on. How many of you would say, okay, we're going to knock it off for two years. No job. We're just going to live on what we've got and what we can scrounge. That'd be pretty tough because we don't live on, live on the land and McDonald's doesn't give you scraps. So... Um, be a little difficult for us. So, uh, my point is that it, I, it's not going to work today, at least not in, in, uh, in fact, maybe in principle, okay? So the Jubilee then talks about three things. It talks about first the Jubilee of the land, which brought the land back to its rest. It also talks about the Jubilee, uh, the redemption of property. 
And when I talk about the redemption of property, I'm speaking not only about the real estate, but also the, uh, the slaves. The theological principle behind the redemption of the property is that the land belongs to God. I would suggest to you this. This would help us an awful lot if we understood everything we own belongs to God. Everything we own belongs to God. I think that our greatest problem is we don't understand that very principle. So that when it comes to church and, the, and some people are offended by, by the pastor talking about giving, well, if everything belongs to God anyway, why do we choke on that? If everything is God's, then, then, then we need to understand that all we have, and, that, and I'm not saying you should drop everything you have in the offering bag, but I'm simply saying it's an attitude that we need to have about everything we are and everything we have. It all belongs to God. That's the theological, that's the fundamental theological principle behind this jubilee and the redemption of property, and that is the land is God's. If a person is forced to sell their land, then the first thing that happens is if you have a near relative, they're given the opportunity to purchase it. Remember the story of Ruth. Ruth, uh, Ruth and Naomi. Um, Naomi takes her and her boys, and her husband and her boys go to a land. The two boys, the husband, die after getting married. Ruth is the daughter-in-law that comes back, and Ruth then takes care of Naomi. She goes to the land of a near kinsman, which happened to be Boaz, and he provided for her. It turns out that they get married. This is a classic example of how this works to where the near uh, um, relative or the near kinsman then has first option to purchase the person that's gone into debt or to relieve them of that debt. If a man's situation then would recover before then, he can buy back his own property. The, the, these things are all clearly spelled out in this passage here. But not only do you have the redemption of property, in the Jubilee you have the redemption from slavery, verses 39 through uh, 55. And I think the first thing we need to understand about this is that slavery in the Bible and slavery, as, as many of us think about it from our Western, especially American perception, it's, it's not the same. Typically, what we think of as slavery is uh, the capturing of human cargo, putting them into ships, sending them over to the New World, and then selling them to be oppressed on, on plantations. And uh, I, I think we would all agree this is totally unacceptable. It's, it's wrong. It's immoral that humans should be trafficked in such a way. Now... When we go back into Bible times, though, typically the reason for a person being in slavery, it's more like imprisonment for a debt because it wasn't a cash society. And if you didn't have the ability to pay a debt, then what you would do is basically you would say, you own me till I work it off. And, uh, and, and that's how the debt was paid. So <clears throat> the ideal thing would be is if you get into debt for whatever reason, you would have a very kind relative who would say, here, let me help you out. And they would buy the debt for you uh, and, and then uh, pay off the debt for you and bring you back into your family and back into your clan. Family was so important. And it was a very close-knit uh, 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 family that would be sure then to, to look after those who had gotten in debt and to, to bring them back. Now, if that's not possible, basically you had to work off your debt Till the year of Jubilee. And if that happened on the first year after Jubilee, then you're pretty much, for the rest of your life, 49 years, then you're going to be working in debt unless somebody can help pay it off for you. And uh, this debt then could be uh, prorated according to how many years were left in the Jubilee. Here's an interesting thing that, again, I, I, I found a bit odd, and honestly, I, I found a little... Um, I don't know. It's probably one of those questions I want to ask God when we get to heaven. Uh, that just means I don't have an answer. So, but the Jubilee did not apply to foreigners. So that if you were a part of the Jewish community living amongst them, in fact, is when they conquered nations, they would actually take the conquered people and make slaves of them. But this jubilee of freedom then was only intended for the Jewish people. It was not intended for foreigners among them. 
in, in our society today, that's a little uncomfortable because we look at everybody as all being the same. But let me put it to you like this. A theological reason underlies this discrimination. Discrimination, that's a nasty word, but clearly what it was. God redeemed his people from Egypt, from Egyptian slavery. They became his slaves. So it is unfitting, therefore, that an Israelite should be resold into slavery, especially to a foreigner. The Jubilee Law is thus a guarantee that no Israelite will be reduced to this status again. And it is a celebration of the great redemption when God brought Israel out of Egypt so that he might be their God and they should be his people. So God is simply saying this. Listen, it was at great cost then that I brought you and redeemed you. I bought you to me. The Jews are known as the people of God. They're his. He's bought them. And so he says, I will take responsible for you. But for those who are outside of that, God says, I can't take that responsibility. I won't take that responsibility. Because they had not yielded then to my lordship, to my ownership. That has repercussions for us as Christians. What does this whole jubilee idea and concept, what does it mean for us living in 2012, a long time after this took place? Maybe 4,000, 6,000 years, maybe. So, the thing is this. Life's a lot different now, don't you think? I mean, again, I, let me remind you, you didn't bring your lamb to sacrifice today to worship God, did you? Or even your chicken where you're going to spill some blood. I mean, you're not going to spill blood to worship God. In the Old Testament, you did not worship God without spilling blood, period. So things are different. Why is it different? Jesus made it different. Jesus made it different because he is the lamb of God whose blood was spilt for us. So today... We don't have to spill blood. Jesus has spilled it for us in our behalf. And it's in a trusting faith that we accept the payment that Jesus has made on our behalf. So things are different. It's also different that we, we don't live on the land or close to the land like we used to. We also have uh, our societies use cash and finances. And that's a whole lot of a whole different thing from, from bartering and, and working with only possessions and things that you have and not having any, any cash. But there's, there's three things, I think, that for us that, that I, uh, I should bring forward. One of them I've already mentioned, and that is the inequity between property, uh, those who have and those. The growing gap between the wealthy and the poor. The major problem in countries today. So how does this help us? The other thing is politics. Uh, don't you love politics? Yeah. <clears throat> They always tell you that you should never talk politics from the pulpit, but what do they know? The question that we have to ask ourselves is, does everything really belong to the government? Do, 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 does, does all that we produce, that, uh, does that also belong to the government? We have to ask ourselves then, or does the government have the responsibility to protect my personal individual rights and possessions? So depending on from where you're from uh, on this, you might say that uh, it, it all belongs, all the property belongs to the government. They'll disperse it fairly amongst all of us. Or you might say, no, 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 I, I bought that. I earned it. It's my money. It's mine. I, it's your responsibility as the government to protect my rights and my possessions. But it's mine. Um, I'd have, <clears throat> and, then, and then the other thing that uh, is always um, um, a hot button is religion. Religion. And boy, that's, you can see the little fires all over the planet because of, uh, because of religion. So these three things, and th these are three major problems that cause great social unrest in our day. And what, what, what can we gather from that? First of all, let me just talk about the accumulation of wealth. The accumulation of wealth. If you ask me about it, I say it's a good idea. The more I have, the better. No. <clears throat> but think about it like this. With regard to the accumulation of wealth, it's clear in this passage that every Israelite has an inalienable right to his family land. Every Israelite has an inalienable right to his family land. When they get into the promised land, in the book of Joshua, you'll see how they divvy it all up. 
And Joshua gives it to all of the different tribes. That's their land. That's the way it was to be in perpetuity. Their land, the underlying principle being it all belongs to God, but God placed them in, their, in those places, and they can always then go back to their land. This tells me this. Uh, there is a, there, the Bible speaks of the right of owning personal property. There's a right, there's a defense of owning personal property. However, it also at the same time promoted the fact that it's the family's property, not individual property. Our emphasis today is not so much on the family as it is on the individual person. We are so, so adamant in our own personal rights. Instead of looking at ourselves as being within a community, the basic unit of which would be the family. The family. Now, <clears throat> The other thing about the, the accumulation of wealth was that the Jubilee was intended to prevent the accumulation of wealth in the hands of a very few, so that over the course of 50-some years, this accumulation might take place, but at the end of 50 years, it's all going to be redistributed right back to where it began from. So at the Jubilee, the poor people were, yes, it's the Jubilee, and I'm free. Hooray for the Jubilee. And so the poor people liked it because it was definitely to their advantage. The wealthy people, I'm sure they didn't like it because they had to get rid of the, the slaves and the property that they had accumulated. But in the long run, it helped for society to stay on an even keel. It helped to promote the basic unit of the family. It meant then that there was going to be pretty much a, a cycl cyclical reboot Every now and then, it's good to take your computer and just reboot it and start all over again. That's in, in this cycle of plans uh, of God, in the seven sevens in the 50th year, after these seven sabbatical years, then God says, reboot, let's go back and start over. How many of you think that's a good idea? Oh, good, everybody. <laughs> I think it probably depends a lot on which side of the financial spectrum you might be. I really think it depends a lot on that. Um, but on the other side, I would suggest this, and, 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 and here's my feeling about it. I'm not an economist. I just know how much is in my pocket. And, uh, but I would say that for us as Christians, what we should say is, you know, God must know what he's talking about. I'm not exactly sure how it's going to work out, but God, God probably knows what he's talking about. So maybe we should just trust God. Easier said than done. <clears throat> so, this accumulation of wealth meant that this cycle was to take place and there was going to be a reboot. Th the land is God's land. The increase comes from God. And so, I would have to say to you that I don't believe that God is a capitalist. Now, I've heard some of my, my, my pastor colleagues say that they believe that God would be a capitalist. Where in the world that came from, I have no idea, except that they personally think that they think capitalism is good. And so, because they think capitalism is good, God must think that too. So, um, God's law does not promote the monopolistic tendencies of capitalism, of, of, of unfettered capitalism. Because basically, in capitalism, the rich grow richer, and nobody's to look out for the poor. Uh, that's not exactly what God had intended. Uh, and, and in case you're trying to figure out what my uh, political standings are, uh, don't. <laughs> because uh, God doesn't promote communism either. And honestly, someone could say, there's some very good, good uh, points in the government redistributing property evenly across society. I, you know, I mean, I, there's some good things in that. There's also some good things in a capitalist society where you get to be rewarded for your own initiative and your own work. I... I, I uh, God says you're going to have to work for a living. No work, no food. I mean, God says that. He understands. But my point is this. The law of God shows that he does not promote someone uh, monopolizing and, and uh, to, to others' demise. And he doesn't promote then where across the board a person is given a free ride because of government. However, we can say this without unequivocally. We, we can say God stands for the poor and the impoverished. And that's why, in its essence, why the Jubilee year was instituted. Because God is concerned that the poor who, who may not have a chance any other way unless God steps in, God gives them that 
chance, that opportunity, so that they should be reminded it's probably only going to happen once in your life. Don't squander it. There's also, in addition to the accumulation of wealth, some principles that we can gather with regard to personal virtues. May I say to you, and again, we, we've talked about this before in our series in Leviticus, that the moral principle we see underlying this is, um, with regard to the land, is that God owns the land, but with regard to the, the overall uh, principle we can see in Leviticus chapter 9, verse 18, he says, You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus repeats this in the New Testament. It's something that came from Leviticus. Jesus repeats it in the New Testament. That is a fundamental moral principle that we live by today as Christians, or we should live by. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. You remember somebody asked Jesus, oh, he's kind of, kind of a smart aleck guy, and says, well, okay, so who's my neighbor? And so then Jesus goes on to explain the one that you despise the most. He's your neighbor. And... Uh, and the story didn't go too well, but uh, he was showing to us exactly who he means and what he means by that. First John um, tells us <clears throat> in chapter 3 that we who have have a moral obligation to help those who don't have. First John chapter 3, verse 17 tells us, but if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? 1 John 3, 17. So he's simply saying us here that as Christians, if we have this world's goods, if we have the things of this world, we see somebody in need, there's, there's no cause to turn our heart against them. In fact, as he goes on to say in James chapter 2, James chapter 2, verse 15 and seven, to 17, uh, if a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. One thing to say, hey, bless your heart. Man, I'm really sorry to say where you are, but God bless you. On your way. Rather than taking the coat off your back and saying, here, let me give this. Let me give this to you. So uh, it, it's, it's clear in this that, that there's uh, the obligation of those who have to take care of those who don't have. And that's, again, what's being taught in this passage, what's also being carried over in the New Testament for us to live by today. We can get that from this. We're also reminded, and I think that this is very key, um, it goes along with the idea that everything we have belongs to God. Now, in Leviticus chapter 25, verse 23, he says this. Leviticus 25, 23. The land shall not be sold in perpetuity, for the land is mine. You are strangers. That word strangers means resident aliens. I have an alien resident certificate. I'm an alien in this country. Actually, actually, my blood-bought soul means I'm an alien resident in this world. So I've got my alien resident card. This is not my home. I'm just passing through. Someday I'm going to go home, not to America, but home to where Jesus is at. So in that, res in that res uh, respect, we're strangers and, re and, and alien residents in this world. We're soldiers, we're pilgrims, we're passing through. We need to be reminded of that relationship in this world. I, I, I need to say it again. We need to be reminded that we're sojourners. We're passing through. We're tourists, if you, would, if you understand that better. That this, we're kind of looking around, but you know, too often, listen, careful folks, I think we are too caught up with putting roots down in this world. We're too caught up with making sure we have the things of this world and the comforts of this world. We're not concerned nearly enough about the fact that we have no roots here. We are alien residents. Our purchase, the, the blood of Jesus Christ has purchased our salvation. We are going to go home to be with him someday. Don't get stuck in this land. Passing through. The last thing I want us to see from this, it leads us then also into our, our um, communion service today, and that is 
the picture of the promised Savior or the Messiah. When, uh, when Jesus preached his sermon in Nazareth, in his hometown, he quoted from a passage of Scripture in Isaiah. Isaiah said, when he was um, uh, talking about this, this acceptable year or the jubilee year, he says in Isaiah 61, verse 1, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound to proclaim the year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. Verse 3 says, To grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. So Isaiah in this picture as a prophet is is speaking then again about that jubilee year, that reboot year, which brings things back up again and gives, uh, proclaims liberty to the captives. It opens up the prisons to those who are, uh, of those who are bound. It's to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So Jesus goes to his hometown in Nazareth, and as is his custom to do on the Sabbath day, he goes to the synagogue. So a hometown boy comes back. Hometown boy comes back, and the rabbi says, Son, do you have a word for us? And Jesus says, sure. So he grabs then the scroll of Isaiah, and the Bible says, and the scroll, this is uh, Luke chapter 4, verse 17 to 21. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll, and he found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has appointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and he gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus took that scripture and said, that was talking about me. I am proclaiming in your midst the year of the Lord's favor. I'm telling you that the captive is going to be set free. The blind is going to be allowed to see. Those who are oppressed are going to be freed from it. Our jubilee year, Christian friend, our jubilee year is the year of our Lord's favor. favor. Here's what Paul then says. Paul, the great Old Testament theologian who gets it in the New Testament, who brings it back home, he says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2. He, he's talking about what Jesus says, and he says, In a favorable time I listened to you. In a day of salvation I have helped you. And he, now he says, Paul says, Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. The day of our salvation is the day of God's favor that he's given to us. It's that jubilee. It's that liberation. It's that freedom. It's the day that we've been set free from our sins. You see, the gospel news to us is like the jubilee to the children of Israel. They looked at it for They looked in anticipation for it. Those who were caught up in debt, those who were caught up with, in, in uh, own, being owned by someone else, they looked with a great anticipation and for the time when they would be released from all that, the time not only to be released, but they could get back to their own land when they can go back home. Listen, folks, that's what the gospel's about. We rejoice in our Savior. He gives us a new beginning. He gives us a new beginning through the payment that he's made for our sins. Just as the debtors and slaves were set free to enjoy the jubilee, so sinners are set free when they trust the Lord to save them. Salvation through faith in Jesus Christ is a glory, hallelujah, jubilee experience. Christ restores us. He restores broken families. He restores lost blessings. He brings times of refreshing again. So it's, it's easy. I mean, I, I can begin to sense the anticipation that Jews would have for the Jubilee, and I can also sense the, 
the grind. I can sense the, the, the hopelessness when there's no jubilee. They didn't practice it. It wasn't going to happen. They had no other hope. And this hope and this, this, this cycle that God gave to them to whereby they, they could have the chance again, the jubilee year of, of being free and being liberated, it wasn't going to happen. And oh, you know what? I know there's people today that, that are looking for that opportunity. When can I be released? When can I be free? When can I be, be, uh, have, have the assurance I get to go home? I think it's the same for the Israelites. The jubilee was too hard for them to accept. Why? Because it was fundamentally based on faith in God that he would sustain you in that freedom jubilee. It's not going to happen, they say. And so often we look at our own circumstances, we look at our own environment, we say, oh, it's not going to happen. It can't happen. Because we don't allow God to step in. We don't allow God to show his power. We don't allow God to show his hand. Not only that, in that year of Jubilee, there were some people who really resisted it because they said it's not fair. You know what? It's not fair. It wasn't about being fair. It was about setting things back again like they, like, like they used to be. It's not about uh, uh, fair. And let me tell you something. This gospel news that Jesus Christ died a horrible death on that cross in my place, that wasn't fair. I sinned. He paid. It's not about fairness. It's about the heart and the love of God for wanting to bring his people back again to give them another chance, to give them another start, to let them experience life to its fullness again. That's what it's about. And that's how it is with our salvation. So it is with the gift of God's salvation through Jesus Christ. God gives us the promise of forgiveness and provision, but it's so hard for people to trust in it. We just need to go back and look at the promises that he gives to them. Those who obey will be incredibly and amazingly blessed. I ask you this morning to just take some time. And you, say, you might say, you know, Pastor, you keep talking about this gospel stuff. You know, the good news, the gift that God's given to us in Jesus Christ. I, I don't know that I have that. I don't know, I don't know what that means. I really sense, you know, that there's something missing in my life, and I'd like to know how I could be sure of that. Let me, let me tell you, it's simple. The Bible says that if we will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you shall be saved. What does it mean to believe? It simply means to believe that Jesus Christ is God. It simply means to believe that Jesus then stepped between me and the judgment of God, and he said, I will take the punishment for David Homer. He's simply saying for you, believe that Jesus, when he hung on the cross, hung between God and your sin, and he absorbed all the judgment and punishment and wrath of God upon himself and absorbed it in your place. Believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God that takes away the sin of the world. Believe that Jesus Christ is is the Savior. And the Bible says, if you will believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, you shall be saved. You say, well, I, I, I want to believe. How do I do that? Just the simplest way is, is, is in your own heart, in the quietness of your heart, just say, God, I believe in you. I desperately need you. I'm a sinner. I know I'm a sinner. And I, there's just something missing in my life, and I want you. And just say, God, I'm trusting that Jesus Christ took my sins on the cross, and I'm trusting that Jesus Christ gives me his righteousness in exchange. Salvation is not hard because Jesus paid it all. If you believe that Jesus Christ took away your sins on the cross, thou shalt, you shall be saved. It's that simple. And as we come to this ceremony today, what this is reminding us of is the fact that Jesus died on the cross and his body was broken. When you see the broken bread being broken up, it's a picture of the broken body of Jesus Christ. When you see us take the cup, it's a picture of the it's grape juice, which is a picture of the body of Jesus that, was, uh, 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 that, that his blood was drained out of 
the blood that cleanses us. You say, well, such a bloody religion. Praise God. Because God said that without the blood, there cannot be any forgiveness of sin. And so today we celebrate the fact that God shed perfect blood, the Lamb of God, so that our sins can be covered and washed away and taken care of. That's what this is about today. So if you're here today, I I encourage you to take part in this if you are a born-again Christian believer. I encourage you too, as someone who has identified with Jesus Christ in baptism. In other words, how do you say, you, 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 what you're saying is, well, I believe, but there's a step of believing is saying, now I'm going to tell others. I'm going to identify with Jesus Christ. We do that through baptism, death, burial, and resurrection, being buried in the water, brought up back out of the water. If you're a believer, baptized, part of this church, we encourage you then, as part of this community, to, to participate in uh, this communion service this morning. So ushers, if you'll come and prepare this. I ask you as the ushers are coming to prepare this uh, communion, that you just quietly in your heart do some personal examining to see then how your standing is with others and how your standing is with God.